Okay, here we are live again on our friendly Facebook, <laughs> right? I don't know if you see me the way I see me or not, but I'm looking kind of dark. I got my lights right here. Everything is normal, but everything seems darker. I have no idea why. Sorry about that. But that's the way it's looking to you. Right? Yeah, I'm looking over here at the Facebook page and it seems to be the same way. A little on the dark side. I don't know. No time to worry about that at the moment, though. We're going to be studying the Bible today in the book of Luke, chapter 20, primarily focusing on the parable of the vineyard owner. <coughs> Excuse me. So, let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as always, we thank you for your word the lessons you teach us, your Holy Spirit to guide us. We ask that uh, your spirit does that now as we open and study your word and learn more about you and how we can be better and better servants for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay. So, Luke chapter 20. Uh, we've kind of jumped around a little bit, you know, uh, since we had our resurrection Sunday and then we came back. And so we had, you know, what we call Palm Sunday, you know, where Jesus entered Jerusalem. Well, this is right after that. This is right after the triumphal entry, right? Jesus enters Jerusalem. All the people are there praising him. Hosanna, you know. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, O son of David, right? Well, at the end of uh, 19, right after that, we have in Luke, verse 45, he entered the temple and began to cast out those who were selling. Of course, this really upset them, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, and you have made it into a robber's den, <laughs> a den of thieves. They were cheating the people, uh, requiring them to buy things, you know, uh, like you had to use the temple coin. You couldn't use Roman money or anything else. You had to use the temple coins. You had to do the money changers. And of course, they were charging you fees to do that, right? All that sort of stuff. And it says he was teaching them daily in the temple. Now, remember, he comes in to Jerusalem on Sunday, right? Uh, and on Thursday, he's crucified. So we're talking about maybe a little time on Sunday, but mostly Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday that he's doing this teaching in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes, you know, the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything that they might do for all the people were hanging upon his words. <laughs> the people were listening, but those who were supposed to be the teachers of Israel, right? were just looking for a way to accuse him. <laughs> they weren't listening to him, right? And we move into chapter 20, and it came about on one of the days while he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel. What's the gospel? The good news? <laughs> the Messiah has come. You know, your sins can be forgiven, <laughs> right? <clears throat> that the chief priests and the scribes with the elders confronted him, and they spoke, saying, tell us by what authority... You are doing these things, and who is the one who gave you this authority, right? Interesting that they want to know, because, you know, he's been healing people, you know, forgiving sins, <laughs> all this stuff that drove them crazy, right? And he answered and said, I will, I shall also ask you a question, and you tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? 
And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? <laughs> if we say from men, all the people will stone us to death, for they considered that John the Baptist was a prophet. Mm -hmm. And they answered and said, We do not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Right? So he's not going to come out point blank and tell them what authority but immediately goes into this parable of the vineyard, right? Right. He, and he began to tell the people this parable, right? A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to the vine growers and went on a journey for a long time, right? Now, everybody knew that Israel was um, the vineyard, right? This was not anything uh, new or out of the ordinary. I mean, all through the Old Testament, we have references of Israel as the vineyard. It was common in Israel to, to understand that, right? So this, we have a vineyard and the owner of the vineyard, right? went on a long journey, okay? <clears throat> and at the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers, okay? In order that they might give him some of the produce of the vineyard, but the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. All right, so... <laughs> And we're going to read down here later that uh, they absolutely knew these Pharisees and the scribes and the elders. They knew Jesus was talking directly to them, that this was about them. Israel is, you know, the uh, vineyard. Okay. The quote slave sent by the owner to them would have been the prophets. And what did Israel do to the prophets? They frequently, they beat them, abused them, right? They didn't treat them with the honor and respect that they would have deserved, very rarely. We have reference to that. Actually, uh, let's take a look at Hebrews 11. And at the end of Hebrews 11, you know, the hall of fame but at the end of it it says and, and others experience mockings and scourgings yes also chains and imprisonment they were stoned they were sawn in two they were tempted they were put it to death with the sword they went about in sheepskins and goatskins being destitute afflicted and ill-treated right this is how they treated the prophets <laughs> you know so uh when they get this parable that Jesus is telling them, they understood what he was saying. So he sent a prophet and they were mistreated. So the slave was sent back, right? And this word for owner, by the way, is lyrios in the Greek, which can also be translated Lord, <laughs> the Lord of the vineyard, right? And who is the Lord of Israel, but the Lord God himself. Right. So we go back to verse 11 and he proceeded to send another slave and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty handed. What do you think these vine growers were thinking when the master, the owner of the vineyard sends somebody, a representative and it's harvest time, so they should be sharing uh, of the profits. I mean, that's the whole deal. You know, you get to work it, and then you get part of the problem, all the proceeds, etc., and the rest of it goes to the vineyard owner, right? And they're like, we don't want to share. We did all the work, right? Now, it wasn't their land. It wasn't their vineyard. They didn't plant it, right? <laughs> you know? They were hired to take care of it, but now they're thinking 
that they should get it all. I guess, right? So they beat the slave and sent back the second one. Okay. And in verse 12, he said, he proceeded to send a third. And this one also they wounded and cast out. Now, <laughs> what kind of patience is the vineyard owner, the Lord of the vineyard, demonstrating here? I mean, he's already sent three people. And they refused to share. They refused to do what they agreed to do when they were hired. So what is the thinking going on? I'm going to ask you this question as we move into this lesson. The Lord God has put into your possession. What? What possessions do you have that God has put under your control? And how are we handling that? What is our vineyard, right? Is it material things, right? Is it talents? Is there any other kind of wealth or, you know, I mean, it could be money, right? You know, what do you have God has provided you God being the owner of all things, right? God is the owner. God owns all the earth. He's the creator. We're the steward. Okay. So what is in our possession and how are we handling that? Are we treating it like the Lord God wants us to? You know, how much of it are we using to expand his kingdom, for example, and how much of it is Larry using for Larry, right? We have to think about that. Israel, right, was God's, and these people that were, shall we say, in charge, because their system put them ahead, both politically and and spiritually, and they were supposed to now take care of the people, but they were cheating the people. And when the prophets came to bring things to light, they would abuse the prophets. They're abusing these representatives that this, the vineyard owner, the Lord God has sent to Israel and sent here in the parable, right? So, he sends a third, right? Same thing happens in verse 13. And the owner, the Lord of the vineyard, said, what shall I do? Question mark. He's thinking, right? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. The son. Now, <laughs> The Jews, the Pharisees, etc., they knew the Messiah would be a representative of God, would be deity on earth. They didn't understand exactly how that was going to work. But here comes Jesus, who is the Lord God on earth in human form. Right? And so as the Lord God sends Jesus to the earth, and here the vineyard owner, the Lord of the vineyard, has sent his son. So what is their reaction to that? He says, I'll send my son and perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another. Now get a load of this reasoning, saying, this is the heir. Let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. Under what law <laughs> would killing the son of the owner create a situation where they would inherit the vineyard? What kind of reasoning comes into play there? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But when your mind is set on evil intent, 
you don't think logically you know you know you're you're like okay <laughs> if we get rid of the air then we get to keep the vineyard well that isn't remotely true but that's you know when you say when your mind is messed up with evil and how many people have done evil things only to suffer the consequences when they thought they were going to be in a good position and how do we deal with that with whatever possessions and talents that we have are we thinking that we can only use them for our benefit for our glory are we attempting to steal them from God? I have to confess that there's a lot of times that I have only thought about how I can do something for me or for my family and not even considered that that talent, that ability, that possession, how I could use that you know, for God. I think we all fit into that category. You know, we all have that sin nature that we have to deal with while we're here on earth. And I think sometimes, you know, that uh, raises his head <laughs> too often, right? So they think they're gonna kill the son and now they'll get the vineyard, which of course doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And you remember the reference here is the Lord, the God of the vineyard had sent his son in this case, Jesus Christ. And what are the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders of Israel? What are they going to do? On Thursday, <laughs> they're going to kill him. Outside the city, right? On Golgotha. Right? And they have been planning how are we going to get rid of him? How are we going to kill him? And he's pointing out that he knows what they're thinking. He knows what's going on, right? You think maybe that might have got their attention, but again, when your brain is set on evil and evil intent, it doesn't work right. You don't think logically, right? And so, they got, they just got more upset what happened, right? They threw him out and killed him. What therefore will the owner, the Lord of the vineyard, of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. Others to work, right? So these people that were in charge of Israel, right? What's going to happen to them after they kill the son? What happens in the gospel when Jesus is killed and the bulk of the Jews reject him as the Messiah? And the gospel is taking to the Gentiles. This probably is a reference to that, that now, you know, and of course it was God's plan all along that, you know, that the Gentiles should be uh, included, you know, in God's plan for salvation. Paul called it the great mystery, right? So, <clears throat> Here he is explaining to these Jewish elders and Pharisees and scribes, right? You know, 
exactly what they're thinking, what they're planning on doing and what the consequences will be. And they're like, okay, <laughs> right? You know, the people, when they heard it said, may it never be, you know, this is in the Greek is an emphatic negative exclamation, you know, no, 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 right? But he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written, the stone which the builders rejected? This is Psalms 118.22. And remember, these teachers of the law, right, they knew this very, very well. So when Jesus quoted these Old Testament scriptures, which he did frequently, right? Almost everything he said was actually a quote from the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, right? This became the chief cornerstone, right? Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but upon whomever it falls, it will scatter them like dust, right? This is also a reference from Isaiah 8, 14 and 15. Again, from the Old Testament, pointing out that those who reject Jesus as these Pharisees and scribes and the elders predominantly did, it's going to be very costly, very costly. And the same thing is true of all of us. The God who created the heavens, the earth, you know, all those galaxies, they tell us there's billions of galaxies and billions of stars in every galaxy. And he created it all just by speaking. But then he created mankind, starting with Adam. And in Genesis, it says that he formed Adam in the dust of the earth. The Hebrew implies that he got down on his hands and knees to create Adam, mankind. He created us in a completely different way than he created everything else, demonstrating his love for man. And he already knew that after he did this, the man was going to reject him and would be separated and he would have to have a plan on how to get man back to a holy God. And that's the plan involving the Messiah to come to die on the cross for our sins. You know, we're not good enough to die for our sins <laughs> and be reconnected to God. Only God is good enough. And that's what he did. The second person in the Trinity, you know, there's three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but it's one God. Right? Three personages, one God. So God paid that price for us. And all we have to do is accept it. Make Jesus our Lord and Savior. Don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees. Don't be, you know, somebody who's, you know, is so set on their own way, their own thing, and their evil intent that their brain can't get their mind around the simple gospel, the simple good news. God did it for you. He did it all. We just accept it and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. It's that simple. Then you are part of God's family, right? In the rest of this chapter, the very next verse says, and the scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour. And they feared the people, for they understood 
that he spoke this parable against them. Right? They knew exactly what he was saying. They knew how he was talking to them about how they are rejecting the son. Right? What is Jesus' favorite name for himself is son of man, which comes from Daniel, which means the Messiah. They knew all that. They knew who Jesus was, who he said he was. He proved who he was, not only by the miracles, but then later with the resurrection on the third day, crucified on Thursday, three days, three nights in the grave. Sunday morning, he rises from the dead to be alive forevermore, <laughs> sitting at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us. When I mess up, which is way too often, <laughs> the devil says, see that, see that, see that. And Jesus says, it's okay, Dad. <laughs> He's one of mine. I got him. That sin is covered by my blood. It's absolutely amazing when you really think about it. And you consider how often we fail. Jesus never fails. He's always there for us. That might raise a lot of questions. If you're watching me on Facebook and you have questions, feel free to hit me up. You know, ask a question in the messenger or whatever. And I'll be glad to see if I can answer it. Pray about it. Let the Lord guide me in answering your question. The gospel is so simple. Man sinned. God forgives every sin because of the blood of Jesus. All we have to do is ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. Come into our life. Forgive us of our sins. And it's taken care of. If our pride won't let us do that, if we think we are good enough, we're doing good enough things, we are solely mistaken. It only takes one sin to separate you from God for all eternity. Just one. And that can be a sin of commission or a sin of omission, a sin in the mind, right? We have a lot of ways to fail, and we do. Jesus paid it all. As the song says, all to him I owe. So anyway, don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees and get stuck in your evil intent. And let the Holy Spirit soften your heart. Realize that you are a sinner, Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Realize the consequence of sin is eternal damnation. You know, it's so expensive. It's too expensive. It's mind-bogglingly expensive to reject Jesus, to be smashed by the stone. Don't do it. Accept Jesus. Become part of the family. Just ask him to come into your heart today. Just ask him. He will. It's that simple. Lord God, thank you that you did this for us. Knowing that we were going to fail, but you had a plan. Help us to be soft in heart to become part of your family by accepting your sacrifice through Jesus Christ and help us handle whatever the vineyard is that you have put in our possession for your glory 
I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. That is our message for uh, Luke in chapter 20 today. God bless you. I pray you have a great, great week.